ga gas is exported as liquefied natural gas because it's got to be frozen and turned into a liquid form so you can actually put it on a ship and send it overseas. So mm -hmm. the liquefied natural gas or LNG exporters actually use more gas, more Australian gas, just to run their export um, and processing facilities than the entire manufacturing sector in Australia. That's just an amazing fact. So Australia's whole manufacturing industry uses less gas than what we use just to export our own gas. Yeah. And one for mum, one for dad, and one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, and you show what you value through the choices you make. Dead, buried, cremated. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't treasurer. be scared. The the treasurer. Australia's basically done for. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy. You know, a banana republic. How good is Australia? Just follow the money. G'day, and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains big economic issues in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and today we are going to unpack the gas and energy crisis currently gripping Australia. Australians are in the eye of a perfect storm of cold weather and low coal and gas supplies, causing power prices to soar. Australia is facing its biggest energy crisis in 50 years, reigniting the cost of living debate. Wholesale electricity prices have skyrocketed from an average of $87 per megawatt hour for the first three months of the year to almost $500 today, a 500% increase. They've been pushed up internationally by the war in Ukraine and domestically by outages at ageing coal-fired power stations. The former government promised a gas-fired recovery and left us a gas bin fire. We produce more gas than you can poke a stick at. It is not fair to say that there is a gas shortage in Australia. Australians are paying through the nose for gas they own because there is a, a gas export cartel that is war profiteering on the suffering of the Ukrainians. We haven't transitioned to renewables fast enough. And we need a rapid transition to renewable energy and battery storage to fix the energy crisis. Last week, the Australian Energy Market Operator, or AEMO as it's known, suspended the national electricity spot market after it became, quote, impossible to operate, end quote, <laughs> amid projected energy shortfalls and the potential for blackouts. So joining me to get into the nitty gritty details of how we got here and how we fix it, I'm delighted to introduce Mark Ogue, Principal Advisor at the Australia Institute. G'day, Mark. Hi, hey, Ebony. Good to be here. Thanks so much for joining us. Now, I was on holiday last week when the proverbial hit the fan, um, but it certainly looked like chaos from someone just dipping into the news of an evening. Can you tell me um, what has gone wrong with our national electricity market and what is the problem that we're having with our gas market at the moment? Yeah, the, the two problems are interrelated. and But the basic problem is that gas prices and coal prices have gone through the roof as a result of our exposure to export prices and the war in, in, in the Ukraine. What, what's happened in the electricity market for the last couple of weeks is caused um, primarily by an increase in global coal prices and global gas prices and the fact that um, Australians have to compete with our own resources on the international market. And uh, a secondary problem is that the um, coal power stations, Australia's coal power station fleet, which supplies over 50% of our electricity, is breaking down a lot. And the combination of both of those things meant there was a shortage of supply and electricity prices uh, skyrocketed on the market. They went up to around $400 a megawatt hour. And then the Australian energy market operator stepped in and capped them at $300 a megawatt hour. So prices can't go above $300 a megawatt hour. That's right. This is wholesale prices. Yep. And then some of the generators said that they couldn't produce electricity at $300 a megawatt hour because the price of coal and gas was so high. And so they um, held back on dispatching electricity and then the market operator eventually stepped in and actually took control of the market and is directly directing generators to dispatch electricity. You haven't heard the breaking news this afternoon is that the national energy market 
has been suspended. Talk about an energy crisis. So normally um, generators can kind of bid into the market and when prices are up, you know, they're making more profits. Um, But this time they were like, no, we're not going to bid in. We can't produce energy for that much, uh, that price. And then the national electricity market, AEMO, was like, well, there's not enough here to keep supply going, is that right? And that's why they've had to step in and just be like, no, no, this isn't on. Yeah, there's a lot of complexity in moving past, but that's basically what happened. Mm. And then separately to that, we're always hearing about gas as um, a so-called transition fuel and that um, partly we could solve this problem if we just had more gas. Is Australia running out of gas, Mark? Australia has got huge amounts of gas And uh, in fact, in Eastern Australia, we've actually tripled gas production in the last seven years, which is one of the largest and fastest expansions of gas development anywhere in the world ever. But the problem is that we, we, we allow pretty much unlimited amounts of it to be exported. So on the East Coast, two thirds of the gas we produce is exported. Australia-wide, the big LNG companies, liquefied natural gas companies, which is gas is exported as liquefied natural gas because it's got to be frozen and turned into a liquid form so you can actually put it on a ship and send it overseas. So Mm -hmm. the liquefied natural gas or LNG exporters actually use more gas, more Australian gas, just to run their export um, and processing facilities than the entire manufacturing sector in Australia. That's just an amazing fact. So Australia's whole manufacturing industry uses less gas than what we use just to export our own gas to other overseas customers. Yeah, that doesn't count the gas that's exported. That's just running the big export facilities. Yeah. I mean, the reality is that Australia doesn't have a gas supply crisis. The problem is that our gas is going overseas. And I think that it's contingent on the government to ensure that we do have sufficient gas for domestic use. There's ways that they can do that. It's our gas. It belongs to Australians. And Australians are entitled to a fair and reasonable price for what belongs to them. WA is currently not suffering any power issues or price hikes thanks to its policy to reserve 15% of gas for local use since 2006. The rest of it. So, Mark, that's a truly astronomical amount of gas. So, effectively, what you're saying is we don't have any supply shortage of gas. We're actually producing more gas than Australia ever has before. We're just exporting it all overseas. We're not keeping any for our domestic market. Is that right? Yeah, we don't have a gas supply problem. We have a gas export problem. And what's happened is that um, if we didn't export gas, we would have uh, an abundance of gas, which we did before we started exporting it from the East Coast about seven years ago. And and before we exported it, we had gas that was had a cost of around 3 to $4 a gigajoule. And we'd still be that maybe a little bit higher Um, if that situation had continued. But unfortunately, in many regards, we opened up these massive LNG uh, liquefied natural gas export facilities in Gladstone and allowed pretty much unlimited export of our gas. And now on the East Coast, two thirds of the gas is exported. And that's done two things. The first is that it's exposed us to global gas prices. So Australian customers now have to compete with exports to buy our own resource. So we used to have a small domestic market where our gas industry only sold to Australians and therefore our price was low because we had lots of gas. And now we're not only exporting it overseas, but we're competing with those markets and we have to take the world price. That's right. And that and that leaves us exposed to supply disruptions like we're experiencing with the war in Ukraine. And and I've got to say, this is a supply disruption, but one thing is certain, there'll be more supply disruptions in the future. And so now that we've allowed these exports, we're sort of permanently exposed to those kind of disruptions. Well, Mark, I'm hoping that at least we've made a shit ton of money out of these exports. Please tell me uh, that, you know, we're getting some... The Australian public's getting some cash out of all these, out of all of our gas exports. I'd love to tell you that, but the the truth is that the these big companies that export gas get a very good deal in terms of um, taxation. So there's different ways that Australians can get a uh, return on the exploitation of our of our resources of our gas resources, 
and um, that can roughly be divided into taxes and royalties. So royalties are, they're not a tax, they're a payment for the for the raw materials. So just like a builder buys bricks or a baker buys flour, um, the gas companies pay the Australian people for the raw material, which is the gas, and um, they can export it. So the states, and in, in, in the case of offshore gas, the federal government can theoretically can impose royalties and states can do it for onshore gas. So the onshore gas in Queensland, they do pay royalties. Uh, Some of the offshore gas in Western Australia, they pay royalties, but about two thirds of the gas that's exported from Western Australia, which is a huge amount, there's no royalties on that at all because the government doesn't levy royalties. The federal government could levy royalties because it's offshore, uh, and the state government can't. And in theory, they would pay what's called the petroleum resource rent tax on that. Um, but in fact, uh, none of the companies that are exporting that, that two-thirds of Western Australian gas actually pay that petroleum resource rent tax. And what's worse, most of them don't pay any company tax at all. So around two-thirds of <laughs> the gas... Nice if you can get it, Mark. Yeah, around. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? To, around two-thirds of the gas that is produced in Western Australia which is vast quantities, they pay pretty much no royalties, no resource rent tax and no company tax. So we're pretty much uh, giving the resource away for free and they're not paying tax. So we're giving, it's worse than that, we're giving the resource away for free basically. They're not paying much if any tax. They're mostly foreign owned companies, am I right there? Yeah, overall the LNG industry, the gas export industry in Australia is 95.7% foreign owned. Right. And and then for all that, we're exporting so much of it and we're linked to the international gas market. And so we're paying higher prices than we should for our gases on top of it. Yeah, absolutely. So every every dollar extra that we pay in in gas prices because of the exposure to exports is, is a dollar that goes in windfall profits to these companies. I mean, that is just an appalling setup. If you were to design an export gas market, surely you couldn't have designed a worse one for Australia if you tried. Yeah, I mean, it's really... Like, is the, where is the benefit for the Australian public at any point along that value chain? I, I wouldn't say there's zero benefit. You know, for instance, the, the Queensland projects, the Queensland LNG projects, which ex, which is where the gas on the East Coast is exported from, they do pay royalties. They paid about $466 million this year. So they've paid for the raw materials. Whether, yep. it, whether they're paying enough is a whole other question. But none of those companies have paid any company tax. Uh, Well, I think Sandos might have paid $6 million or something like that over the last seven years that we've got data from the ATO available for. Um, But other than that, none of them have paid any company tax and they're not subject to the petroleum resource rent tax, which in itself is a bit of a scandal because the federal government um, exempted them from petroleum resource rent tax after an inquiry a few years ago even though the inquiry didn't recommend that it was exempted from that tax. You know, it's not that there's no return, but it's a ridiculously low return for Australians for for basically the once-off exploitation of our natural resources. Yeah, all that gas that we're exporting, that's that's it. Once it's gone, you can't. You can't drill it up twice. No, it's it's a it's a one trick pony, and once it's gone, it's gone, and and we'll we've missed the opportunity to benefit from that. And mm. you know, the gas industry will say, well, we've spent huge amounts on capital expenditure, and you know, we'll pay tax eventually. But the experience is that the check's always in the mail, and so you, you can actually go back as we've done and looked at what they were promising when they were trying to get approval. And they were promising that, you know, tens of billions of dollars in tax would have been paid by now that it has never has, has never, never materialized. Appe- materialized because they have very favorable arrangements for um, deductions and that kind of thing. So we're, we're just we're really not getting much benefit at all. And particularly when you compare it to other countries like Qatar or Saudi Arabia or, or Norway, um, who actually tax them at very, very high levels and. And, uh, you know, in the case of Norway in particular, particular, put it into a sovereign wealth fund 
um, Australia is getting very, very little return. Mm. I think the government ought to consider a windfall tax. A lot of the gains to Australian gas and coal exporters are a windfall. But Treasury Secretary Ken Henry has bought into Australia's energy crisis, suggesting a windfall tax on gas exports should be introduced. Given where we are now, I do think a gas export windfall tax would be the most effective way to reduce the domestic price below the world price to guarantee sufficient supply of gas for domestic uh, users, both households and businesses. And of course, it would have the additional benefit of generating very substantial revenue for the budget. And the budget is certainly in need of additional revenue. Does it frustrate you that we're in this situation? Well, it does. Nobody in Australia can say they didn't see this coming. Which I guess brings us back to the national electricity market as a whole and the problems that we had last week. So you've just walked us through all the problems with our gas industry, which are huge. Uh, It's also a fossil fuel. It's making climate change worse every time we keep burning it. But another big problem in our national electricity market that you mentioned that I just want to come back to is the unreliability of our ageing coal-fired power fleet and the fact that A lot of them are due to retire in the next kind of 10 years, and we've all known about this for a long time, but the federal government under the coalition essentially was trying to delay that, trying to keep coal-fired power stations around for longer, and they're very unreliable. They break down a lot of the time. Taking us back to the national electricity market as a whole, How does gas and coal feed into the problems that we saw last week with the national electricity market? What are the problems that we've failed to kind of deal with? There's two problems. Uh, The first and I think the biggest problem is just the increase in gas and coal prices. So the fuel's just too expensive. You know, some of the generators are saying they couldn't produce electricity for under $300 a megawatt hour. And, you know, 12 months ago, the average wholesale price was $75 a megawatt hour or around that. So, yeah, you've got this fundamental problem that because we're exposed to global prices through coal and gas exports, um, to varying degrees, our electricity generators are exposed to those prices. And, yeah, they basically can't afford the fuel. It's it's pretty simple. Um, you know, fossil fuels are just, uh, just very expensive. Mm. Um, so that's part of it. And then the other part is that, yeah, we have this legacy coal fleet and they've always broken down a fair bit, but they're breaking down more because they're getting older. And the problem with when coal and gas power stations break down is they have very big generation units. So you'll typically lose hundreds of megawatts suddenly and without any warning. And that makes it really difficult to supply enough electricity. And over recent Well, probably the last 12 months, it's just got worse and worse. There was the huge um, fire and explosion at um, Calide Power Station in Queensland, which led to sort of cascading outages in Queensland, and that was a disaster, and um, and Calide stayed offline for a long time. And then just over recent months, up to around 30% of the coal power stations in the national electricity market have been offline at any one time. So that's a really big chunk out of the power that we were relying on. That should be available. Yeah, Yeah. that we're relying on. And Mark, I have heard this said, but is it true that the states that are more reliant on coal-fired power in particular are facing the highest prices at the moment? What's this doing to electricity prices? Yeah, that's exactly right. So both the Australian Energy Market Operator, AEMO, and the Australian Energy Regulator, the AER, uh, released reports recently. Before this actual crisis, both released reports saying that wholesale and retail prices were going up a lot and um, and they were very specific about the causes. They said the main causes were the increasing cost of fuel, coal and gas, and the increasing breakdowns of uh, coal power stations in particular. And also, interestingly, problems actually getting coal to the power stations because of flooding of the of some of the mines in Queensland. So it's all... Right. It's so if all you're a coal-fired co- power station with a coal mine next door, you're all right. But if you're shipping in coal from somewhere else, you're in a bit of trouble. 
Yeah, well, there's there's issues with different mines flooding, basically, yeah. and uh, and AEMO and the AER said that that was one of the key factors. So it all goes back to either the unreliability or the cost of or the cost of fossil fuels. And uh, well, there is actually an additional factor, and that is that there was also record demand at various points, largely because of the very high temperatures in in Queensland on the east coast uh, earlier in the year and, and cold temperatures now yeah and cold temperatures now and that's and and the high temperatures is a result of you know we're, we're getting more and more extreme temperatures so that's that's not going to get any better so it's a climate related thing and in terms of the cold temperatures i think it was the coincidence of a lot of coal power stations being offline having a bit of a cold snap in victoria and and parts of the east coast of australia and yeah, so we ended up getting this big uh, spike in prices and and an inability to supply enough electricity. Mm. Returning to our top story now, and the Australian Greens are speaking in Sydney about the proposed capacity mechanism where coal and gas-fired plants could be paid to ensure there's enough power in the system. We can bring you that now. And the idea of paying coal and gas to stay in the system for longer isn't just going to make the climate crisis worse but it's rewarding those big coal and gas corporations that have been holding us to rent. And so where do we go from here, Mark? I've been hearing about this idea of a capacity market. What does that mean? Yeah, so the idea of a capacity market is you pay various types of generators to, so power stations or or it doesn't have to be a power station, it could be a battery or renewable energy, um, you know, solar farm, that kind of thing. You pay them to have dispatchable power available. And dispatchable power is considered to be power that you can, that's not variable. Uh, So it'll be coal, um, gas, batteries, pumped hydro, hydro, or potentially solar thermal, if we had any, would, would be the same. Yeah, so they would be given payments to have that capacity available, ready to go. go. Yeah, what's being proposed is that that's done through some kind of an auction. So generators with potential dispatchable capacity bid in bid in at an auction. So, And ultimately, electricity consumers pay for that. Yeah. And so there's concerns about this as another kind of a complex market on top of a complex market. Yeah, Is yeah. it going to fix the problem? Well, look, what it doesn't do is... Uh, address the underlying problem, which is that fossil fuel prices are really high, and we're exposed to global fossil, you know, global prices because of our exports. So it doesn't address that at all, and that's the main problem. Mm. Um, it may address sort of some aspects of the problem in terms of keeping some generators going that otherwise might have closed down because they couldn't uh, compete properly, like um, keeping coal power stations going and gas power stations going when they're having trouble competing against renewables. And if, and it could also be used are... to build new battery storage and uh, and pumped hydro. So how did Canberra escape the energy crisis? The answer goes back 10 years to the ACT's decision to aim for a 100% renewable electricity supply. If we'd got onto renewables with a smart grid modern rules put money into storage we wouldn't be dependent upon fossil fuels which are proving unreliable and costing a fortune and renewables mark um let's just go through why they're actually cheaper to build Mm. i mean not only i guess do you have the big capital costs of setting up a mine um and all the rest of it but as you've said exposed to the global prices in the market and you know we know they can go both up and down it's very variable but at the end of the day you still have to keep buying coal and gas to feed into your plants whereas once you've built solar and wind yeah that's always there yeah that's exactly (laughs) that's exactly how it works is it there's look there's higher capital costs uh with building a new solar plant or wind farm uh, initially than say building a gas power station, but over time you spend a lot of money on fuel and and uh, maintenance and various things. So what the CSIRO have said is that even with the cost of extra transmission and storage, renewable energy is already far cheaper than or is already uh, cheaper in most circumstances than coal and gas. And that's even when coal and gas prices were down at relatively low levels, say about $8 a gigajoule, now, mm. they're, now they're like $40 a gigajoule. So even then, 
renewables with transmission and with storage so they could supply power 24-7 were cheaper than building new coal and gas power stations and uh, the trend is for coal and gas to get more expensive and renewables to get cheaper. The, the role from of gas in, in the energy transition is vastly overstated by the, the gas industry and the fossil fuel industry. I think what you find is, is in order to maintain a safe climate and to meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement, we need less gas. What I'm seeing now is the gas industry is basically using the, the Russian induced energy crisis as a justification for essentially busting the Paris Agreement. And it's one of mounting concern for all of those in the energy and climate business looking at how to meet the Paris Agreement. So, looking ahead, Mark, what do you think's going to be happening in terms of changes and, and policies that we're looking at to fix this problem, given that we've got a new federal government that's much more interested in reducing emissions in an orderly transition um, away from coal and gas you know, we've at least got something to start working with there. How do you think um, things are going to play out in the next couple of months? Look, it's hard to say how things will play out, but I think I think taking a step back, there's we're really fortunate in one way, and that is that there are cheaper alternatives to coal and gas for pretty much any use. So, for instance, uh, with gas for generating electricity, renewables, as I just mentioned, renewables with storage and transmission is cheaper than gas for electricity generation. We also use gas for heating houses and hot water and cooking. And for all of those things, efficient electrical systems are far cheaper than gas. So if you incentivise households to uh, switch over to reverse cycle air cons instead of gas heaters and and um, heat pump hot water systems and induction cooktops, those households will save hundreds, potentially over $1,000 a year. And then you free up some gas where it's harder to transition into in um, manufacturing, but, but you're no longer dependent on gas and you're no longer exposed to those prices. So it gives, um, it reduces energy costs for households and businesses and industry. And, uh, gives us um, energy security because we're not over the barrel of of global fossil fuel prices. So it's a win-win situation. So that's fantastic. Yep. It'll just take a little while to do that. And I think in the meantime, in terms of the gas market, what we need is a windfall profits tax because these companies are making windfall profits, not through anything they're doing, just because the price has increased. So Yeah, it's not like they've gotten magically way better at digging up gas or no. exporting it or anything. There's not no, the, huge productivity gains. The price of gas has just gone up. Yeah, they're selling the same amount of gas to the same customers. They're just charging four times as much for it because they engineered a situation in the first place where they exposed us to global gas prices. So it's entirely fair for us to get have a windfall tax to take that money back and compensate households and uh, yes. and, and business and industry for the additional kind of huge costs they're incurring and that's a you know very sound economic thing to do in fact ken henry the former treasury secretary has just come out today in support of a windfall profit tax uh, on the gas industry so i think that that's a really good thing to do and then we have to just start building renewable energy with storage uh, as quickly as we possibly can to get off gas for our electricity supply and as we build up our electricity supply with renewable energy and storage, we need to electrify as quickly as we can. So instead of uh, heating our houses with gas, we heat houses with electricity, we heat our hot water with electricity, we cook with electricity, and a lot of industrial processes um, use heat, and that heat can also be provided by electricity. But we need governments to provide incentives for households and industry to buy the equipment they need or the appliances to make that shift. Mm. Well, we might have to wrap it up there. Thanks very much, Mark. No worries. Thanks, Ebony. This episode was recorded on Tuesday the 21st of June and things may have changed since recording. You can visit australiainstitute.org.au for all our latest gas, climate and energy research and content and we're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett, that's a double N, double T, and Mark Ogue is at Mark Ogue. 
This episode was produced by Jennifer Macy and I want to thank her for filling in for me while I was away on holidays. And you can find her at Jennifer Macy. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Stay safe out there and thanks for listening. Oh, 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 oh,